Hey guys, welcome. If you just don't get shaders or you feel like they're like black magic that kind of just spits out really cool looking effects and you desperately want to learn how to do them too, and maybe you've even tried but it just didn't click for you, then this video is for you. Ready? Let's go. Now let's start right at the beginning. What is a shader? Because even this gets a little bit muddied sometimes. Historically, shaders used to only be about color and lighting. They shaded pixels. Shaders are much more broad now though, so a modern shader is code that runs on your GPU. That's it. Now usually the term shader is referring to the graphics side where some code runs on the GPU and somehow you get a really cool post-processing like effect on the other side. But you can also use shaders to run complex math or functions to benefit from what GPUs are good at, which is running code in parallel. We call these compute shaders. But in this video, we are going to focus on traditional graphical shaders. So with the terminology cleared up, again, what is a shader and how does it work? High level, a shader has two parts, the fragment shader and the vertex shader. The fragment shader runs for every single pixel on a drawn object. And the vertex shader runs for every single vertex on that drawn object. So I'm going to use an analogy to hopefully make this as clear as possible. Let's call everything that we can see on our screen the United States. And we have this cube here, which is obviously Utah. Now we wanna create a shader that is going to paint this random noise pattern across Utah by painting one house at a time. The houses are our pixels. So by the time that we're done, Utah should look like this. Now, thanks to the vertex shader, our shader actually knows where Utah is within the United States. Because the vertex shader is like having surveyors mark every corner of Utah and mark those positions on the map, along with other information like UV coordinates, normals, etc., etc. So now our fragment shader workers get assigned to paint every single individual house inside of Utah. Every one of those workers is given a color to paint houses with, but we want Utah to look like this after. So how do the workers with the white paint and all the colors of gray and the workers with black paint, et cetera, et cetera, how do all those workers know which houses to paint? They follow the map, which is our UV coordinates. UV coordinates are not optional for shaders. That's why if you've ever tried to create geometry from scratch and you forgot to assign the UVs, only the default color shows. But as soon as we assign the UV coordinates to our mesh, it shows up like we want. And even if you're used to 2D, it's the same thing. Everything is a mesh, even sprites. So this applies to 2D and 3D as well. So what are UVs? They're obviously important, but what are they? And what do they have to do with coordinates exactly? So going back to our analogy for a second, the UVs are like home addresses, but instead of, you know, 57 Queen Street, each house gets a vector two ID between zero and one for its address. So the bottom left pixel, that's zero, zero. Bottom right's gonna be one, zero. Top left is zero, one. And top right is one, one. And it's not just those four, every other pixel on the screen will have a value between zero and one for its X and Y position as well. If you've ever worked in Blender, you'll be very familiar with UV unwrapping. Those UVs are no different than the UVs we're talking about in our shaders. All you're literally doing is unwrapping, like a Christmas present, the UVs from the model to try to get them flat or try to get them in 2D space. When you create a 2D sprite, that's not necessary because everything is already in 2D, so your UVs are already unwrapped. So when we wanna use a shader to color our object like this, our UVs and our texture will map each other one to one pixel for pixel. Pixel 00, zero on the UV will grab pixel 00, zero from the texture and paint it onto our object. It's only confusing in 3D because it's just a bit more unintuitive to unwrap something from 3D into 2D. You'll get some creases and odd edges, and that can't be avoided for the same reason that it's not even possible for our 2D maps of Earth to perfectly show the scale of every single country. Something always gets warped in the process. So that is essentially it. You bring in a sprite or a 3D model and import it into Unity. It'll already have unwrapped UVs, hopefully. Our engine's rasterizer will draw the mesh and our shader will do whatever we tell it to do to every pixel and to every vertex. So now you know how, when I plug this texture into base color in our fragment shader, how it's actually accomplishing that in our scene. And once you understand that, some of the other shader magic that we can do might start to make a little bit more sense, like tiling our noise, for example. 
The tiling and offset node is a UV node, just one that gives us a little bit more control. So if we're warping our coordinate system by squashing and stretching it, well then the output is going to change because these pixels just go where the UVs tell them to go. And if I offset it, it's just going to scroll it. So by adding a time node and plugging that into a tiling and offset node, that's going to scroll it for us over time. And now if you want direct control over that, we could create a vector2 property and multiply our time by that. And now plug that in. Now we can control the X and the Y scrolling speed. So I'm sure you can tell you can get really creative and you can do a lot of really cool effects just by learning how to manipulate UVs a little bit. Now, I do find that the second thing that seems to trip up and confuse most people about shaders is you're often doing math operations with colors, which just is not very intuitive, like at all. Except you probably have done this before. Like maybe you've written a coroutine that slowly decreases the alpha of a sprite or an image over time. That isn't any different than what we're trying to do with shaders, except to do math with shaders, you need to understand one thing. Every color is just a number. And what do I mean by that? I mean, every color is divided into three channels, red, green, and blue. That's your RBG, and the A would be alpha, meaning transparency. So 100 would be red, 0 0.500 would just be a darker red, and the closer it gets down to zero, the closer to black it gets. So I'm just gonna put that back up. Red and green make yellow. Red, green, and blue make white. And that used to trip me up because I thought of color mixing the same way that I would with paint. And shaders do not work the same way that paint would. If you mix red, green, and blue paint, it would make like a muddy brown or something because paint absorbs light. With our shader, you need to think of it more like light wavelengths. With light, when you add a red wavelength and a green wavelength and a blue wavelength, you will get white. So that is just something to keep in mind. So black is 000 and white is 111. And this is important to understand so that you can start doing math operations in your shaders. So if we multiply white by black, meaning one times zero, we get zero. If we add one plus zero, we still have one. If we subtract one minus zero, we still have one. And if we divide one by zero, we get our error color because you can't divide things by zero. So maybe that makes sense, but how does knowing this actually help us in any way with actually shading things? And also what happens if we get values below zero or above one? So for the first question, masking is a really great example here. If you've made shaders for 2D, you'll know that it's a little bit more annoying and more difficult to make shaders in 2D because you need to constantly track both the color and the alpha. It's more annoying, but you can also do some really cool things with the alpha once you know how to mask. For example, I have this cool procedural fire shader here and it looks okay. But when I output this, I want it to be in the shape of kind of a campfire, not just a square like this. So you can bring in a texture, any texture you want. We're gonna use this one. And with the alpha, we already know that one is opaque and zero is transparent. So we only want the fire to exist within this shape here. So we just multiply them together. This would be our alpha input. As for our other questions, what happens if we get values below zero? Well, the short answer is the shader will still treat the output like it's black, like it's zero, but it can screw up your math operations. So here we're subtracting white from black, so zero minus one, which gives us minus one. Now you can't really tell it's minus one because this just looks black, which would be zero. Except if we add white to this, normally when you add white to black, you get white since one plus zero is one. But since this is negative one, we're still just getting black. Except now this actually does equal zero instead of minus one, which we can prove by adding white one more time. And now we get white. This is why sometimes you'll see people use either clamp or saturate nodes. They do the exact same thing. It just keeps the values between zero and one. Now for the flip side, when numbers go above zero, they enter the high dynamic range. This is when you can start getting bloom if you have the proper global volume set up. Right here, we're multiplying our color output with a bloom amount, and as we increase it, it starts to glow. 
Now, you're not just going to be doing math with colors and shaders. You can also start getting some pretty cool effects when you do math with the UVs themselves as well. Just forget the colors of what the UV looks like. That always confuses me anyways. The bottom left corner is 00, top right is 11. Every pixel on the UV has a coordinate based on its position. And when you do math operations within UV pixels, you're simply changing the UV coordinates slightly. For example, here I've generated some Voronoi noise and animating it with a time node. And the reason I'm doing that is to get some nice clean segments in here for some distortion. Now we can multiply this by a strength and add it to our UV. Now those become the new UVs that we're going to use when we're sampling our sprites texture. And we get this interesting distortion effect. And masking works with UVs as well. This is a little trick that you can use to get a mask just on the bottom. And now if we multiply this by our mask and add that to the UV, we get the same distortion except it's not distorting on the bottom because we masked that out. So all of the examples that I've shown you so far have only been dealing with the fragment shader. And the main reason for that is because, in all honesty, that's mainly what you're going to be dealing with most of the time when you're working with shaders. But you can just as easily move the position of each vertex as well. And just to show you a really simple example, if we add one to our current position, it'll go up and right because we added one on the X and one on the Y. It's not actually moving the game object, it's just moving the vertices. And you can do some pretty neat stuff with this. Like here, we are applying a sine wave to the Y position of our vertices, which makes this weird squash effect on our cube. All right, so I really hope that this helped you guys. If you're looking to improve in Shader Graph, what I would recommend is just watching and following along with a few more shader tutorials, but then experiment and try to expand on the ideas that they teach you as well, which is what's gonna really solidify it for you. I have put up a playlist of all of the Shadograph tutorials that I've made on this channel if those will help you. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week.